Hi all. In this presentation, we're going to talk about the slow 1996, which is the accruals anomaly. So first, what is the research question? Previous literature on financial statement analysis has suggested that the accrual and cash flow components of current earnings could have predictive power on future earnings. In addition, some prominent financial analysts have stated that investors typically focus on reported earnings, which creates an opportunity to analyze the accrual and cash flow components of current earnings to identify missed price securities. As such, the research question of this paper is to find out what information do accrual and cash flow components of earnings contain and what is the extent to which this information helps predict stock prices. Uh, so why is this research question important? This research question is important because it helps provide investors an opportunity to identify mispriced securities and take advantage of those mispricings. Additionally, investors, researchers, and fund managers could try to regress out the effect that accrual and cash flow components of earnings have on stock prices, thus allowing them to assess their investment strategies or propose risk factors more, more fairly. So here are the two hypotheses that Sloan formulated. The first is that the persistence of current earnings performance is decreasing in the magnitude of the accrual component of earnings and increasing in the magnitude of the cash flow component of earnings. The second is that the earnings expectations embedded in stock prices fail to reflect fully the higher earnings persistence attributable to the cash flow component of earnings and the lower earnings persistence attributable to the accrual component of earnings. The second hypothesis also implies that a trading strategy taking a long position in the stock of firms reporting relatively low levels of accruals and a short position in the stock of firms reporting relatively high levels of accruals generates positive abnormal stock returns. So what does the past literature say? In addition to the group of previous in addition to the previous literature that suggested examination of the accrual and cash flow components of current earnings for the purpose of predicting future earnings, Sloan also points out that previous literature indicates that stock prices reflect investors' naive expectations about valuation attributes such as earnings. In addition, previous literature also investigates whether stock prices respond to accrual and cash flow components of earnings and concludes that the release of accrual and cash flow information does not generate a shift in stock price. So in this paper, the time period of the data sample begins in 1962 and ends in 1991. And the data sample includes all firms with available financial statement data on CompuStat and monthly stock returns data on CRISP. Notably, CompuStat does not cover the data required to compute operating accruals for banks, life insurance, or property and casualty companies. In the end, the data sample includes 40,679 firm year observations. For each firm year observation, the three important financial variables are earnings, accruals, and cash flow operations. Earnings is defined as operating income after depreciation. Accruals is computed as change in current assets minus change in cash and cash equivalents minus the quantity change in current liabilities minus change in debt included in current liabilities minus change in income taxes payable minus depreciation and amortization expense. Finally, the cash flow component is computed as earnings minus accruals. Okay, let's look at table one. Mean and median values of selected characteristics for 10 portfolios of firms formed annually by assigning firms to deciles based on the magnitude of accruals. Panel A exhibits a negative relation between accruals and cash flows and a positive relation between accruals and earnings. Thus, sorting on the absolute magnitude of accruals is similar to sorting on the relative magnitude of the accrual component of earnings. First row of panel B shows that the beta is higher for the extreme accrual portfolios but Sloan notes that hedge portfolio with equal size long and short portfolios in portfolio 1 and 10 respectively would have a beta of only 0 0.02. The second row of panel B shows that extreme accrual portfolios are generally smaller, but Sloan notes that a hedge portfolio with equal size long and short positions in portfolios 1 and 10 respectively would have negligible net exposure to small firms. Panel C of Table 1 shows that the majority of the variation in accruals is attributable to variation in the current asset component. Okay, now Table 2. 
results from ordinary least squares regression of future earnings performance on current earnings performance. This table, along with table three, tests the first hypothesis that earnings performance attributable to the accrual component of earnings is less persistent than earnings performance attributable to the cash flow component of earnings. Overall, this table shows that earnings performance is mean reverting with an average persistence parameter alpha one of around 0.8. Table three results from ordinary least squares regressions of future earnings performance on the accrual and cash flow components of current earnings performance. Unlike table two, the equation used to regress the results displayed in table three separates the accrual and cash flow components of current earnings. The pooled and industry level coefficients in both panel A and panel B show that gamma two is larger than gamma one. Thus, earnings performance attributable to cash flow components is more persistent than earnings performance attributable to accrual components. Table four results from nonlinear generalized least squares estimation of the stock price reaction to information in current earnings about future earnings. Along with table five, this table tests the second hypothesis that stock prices fail to reflect the different properties of the accrual and cash flow component of earnings. The alpha ones and alpha one stars are very similar, suggesting that stock prices anticipate the average persistence of earnings performance. Additionally, Sloan notes that this table indicates that the stock prices correctly reflect the implications of current annual earnings for future annual earnings. He points out that the post earnings not to drift documented Bernard and Thomas 1989 is unique to quarterly earnings changes. In table five, which we'll get to here, uh, table five, which is results from nonlinear generalized least squares estimation of the stock price reaction to information in the accrual and cash flow components of current earnings about future earnings. Table five is similar to table four, but the accrual and cash flow components of current earnings performance are regressed separately. However, unlike in table four, stock prices do not reflect the different implications of the accrual and cash flow components of current earnings for future earnings. This is evidenced by the difference between gamma one and gamma one star and between gamma two and gamma two star. The difference is observable in both regression methods. Overall, this table indicates that the market fails to anticipate the higher persistence of earnings performance attributable to the cash flow components of current earnings and the lower persistence of earnings performance attributable to the accrual component of earnings. In table six, the time series means of equal weighted portfolio abnormal stock returns. This table tests the extension of hypothesis two, namely about whether a trading strategy that long, that goes long firms reporting low accruals and shorts firms reporting high accruals could generate positive abnormal returns. Indeed, table six exhibits a negative relation between the magnitude of accrual components and the size adjusted returns of the corresponding portfolio. For example, in the first column detailing the size just return for the first year following the portfolio formation, the portfolio of lowest accruals returned 4.9%, while the portfolio of highest accruals returned negative 5.5%. This relation is still observable in the second and third years following portfolio formation, but the relation becomes weaker with time. Overall, Table 6 shows that a hedge portfolio that goes long firms with low levels of accruals and shorts firms with high levels of accruals could generate significant positive size just returns as evidenced by the last row of the table. And so that concludes uh, the introduction to Sloan 1996. If you would like to replicate this paper uh, with the more recent time data, please go to our video, uh, which is how to replicate uh, the accruals anomaly Sloan 1996 in, uh, from scratch using Python. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.